okay uh, good evening everyone so we welcome you all to the uh, webinar series jointly organized by asrmpt and srm college of physiotherapy and uh, today's session uh, mr satish will be the moderator for the today's session and today's topic is anterior cruciate ligament and uh, the key points which we are going to discuss is the uh, detailed structural anatomy and biomechanics and injury and the conservative management and today's speaker is ms bipasha choudhury and she belongs to ug 2004 batch and she had completed her uh, mpt in musculoskeletal in the year of 2011 from dibins college dehradun after pg she had gained her experience in working with many cricket association like assam cricket association baroda cricket association and manipur cricket association and currently she is working as a consultant physiotherapist freelancing at exercise physiotherapy at wadodara so uh, so now i request ms bipasha to carry on with her presentation thank you sir thank you raja sir you. shall i start sir yes sir. yes yes, yes please. all right good evening everyone so we are going to talk about anterior cruciate ligament a detailed structural anatomy biomechanics injury and conservative management so this is the knee joint here this is the femur this is the tibia and we have this acl coming from behind to front that is from posterior to anterior acl is a band of dense connective tissue which courses from femur to tibia acl is a key structure in the knee joint as it resists the anterior tibial translation and rotational loads the at knee extension the acl has its length mean length of 32 mm and the width is about 7 to 12 mm there are two components in acl one is uh, anterior medial bundle and the other is posterior lateral bundle we'll discuss about anterior medial bundle and posterior lateral bundle in details later let us see the development inside the womb development of acl inside the womb at fourth week of gestation the knee originates from vascular femoral and tibial mesenchyme blastoma of femur and tibia at ninth week numerous immature fibroblast having scanty cyclo cytoplasm and fusiform nuclei composes the cruciate ligament after 20 weeks marked growth we can see in the acl and two bundles are already formed orientation is more parallel compared to an adult acl let us see the anatomy now gross anatomy of an adult acl uh it has two attachments the origin is femoral attachment and the insertion is tibial attachment uh the femoral attachment there is a band of dense connective tissue uh, attached to a fossa on the posterior aspect of the medial surface of lateral femoral condyle as you can see in this picture the femoral attachment is in the form of a circle with the anterior border straight and posterior border convexity is parallel to the posterior articular margin of the lateral femoral condyle the long axis is tilted slightly forward from vertical the acl runs anteriorly medially and distally to the tibia now we'll come to the insertion that is the tibial attachment the acl is attached to a fossa in front of the lateral in front of and lateral to the anterior tibial spine it passes beneath the transverse meniscal ligament a few fascicles attached to the lateral meniscus here we can see a little clinical significance because uh for more than 50% of acl injuries is always associated with lateral meniscus injury tibial attachment is wider and stronger than femoral attachment spatial orientation welsh and arnoski described the acl as being the single broad continuum of fascicles with different portions taut throughout the range of motion 
So the ACL is functional throughout range of motion, knee range of motion in both flexion and extension. How it is continuum throughout the range of motion that we will see now. Functionally, Girgis et al. divided ACL into two parts, AMB and PLB, as we have seen before. While few other authors have separated the ACL into three function, three functional bundles: the AMB, intermediate, and PLB, posterolateral bundle. It courses anteriorly, medially, and distally across the joint, turning slightly outwards, lateral, spiral, fanning out over broad flattened area. This is due to the orientation of the bony attachments. So, depending on the origin orientation, the function varies, both for AMB and PLB. Let us see the origin of AMB. Both originate from the same place, the proximal aspect of femoral attachment and inserts uh, at the anterior medial aspect of the tibial attachment, insertion of AMB. The PLB while is inserted at the posterolateral aspect of the tibial attachment. Orientation, AMB is more vertical and PLB is more horizontal. That's why AMB is more functional during the flexion of the knee. The femoral attachment of ACL assumes a more horizontal ori orientation, causing the AMB to tighten and restrain the anterior tibial load. PLB is horizontal, so it is tight during the extension of the knee while AMB is moderately lax during the extension. Internal rotation lengthens the ACL a little more than does external rotation, most noticeably at 30 degree of flexion. That's why while uh, checking the ACL clinically, while doing the special test, we do this uh, test called lateral pivot shift test, where the knee is kept at 30 degree and internal rotation and valgus stress uh, force is given. We'll see that in the later videos. Markov et al. reported that ACL acts as uh, a secondary restraint to varus valgus angulation at full extension. The second, the two group presentation simplifies the dynamics of ACL through the range of motion. While a functional AMB is defined in flexion, a PLB is present in extension. So we can see the continuum of uh, the action of ACL. The ACL is actually a continuum of vesicles, a different portion of which is taught throughout the range of motion. Let us see the myomechanics. It is a complex structure. ACL is uh, health, ACL functions mechanic, function is mechanical stability and proprioceptic feedback to the knee. It restrains the anterior translation of the tibia, prevents hyperextension of knee, acts as a secondary stabilizer to stress, reinforcing the medial collateral ligament. As we see, it reinforces the med medial collateral uh, ligament. So even with the meniscal injury, medial collateral ligament injuries are also as associated with ACL, ACL injuries. Uh, it controls the rotation of tibia on femur in femoral ex extension of 0 to 30 degree. PLB plays a significant role in the stabilization of the knee against a combined rotatory load. It's more of a restraint to rotation than AMB. AMB, however, has shown to take up more applied external force in higher flexion ranges. Understanding the microanatomy of ACL. So as I said, ACL is a complex structure. So they're saying ACL is a complex ultrastructural organization. Um, varied orientation of the bundle in ACL and abundant elastic system make it very different from any other ligament or tendon. It can withstand multi-axial stresses and varying tensile strains. So here we can see I'll just take a pointer. Okay. So this is a ligament. So this is a fascicle. 
and inside the vesicles we can see small fibrils inside the fibrils this is a fibril fibril inside the fibrils we can see many subfibrils and these subfibrils have microfibrils and inside them are the collagen molecules so the ligament and tendons generally this is taken from the biomechanics book that we read in our uh, third year uh, cynthia norkings so fibroblast ligaments and tendons have 20% uh, of fibroblast extracellular matrix is 80% inside the extracellular matrix there are fibers and brown substances fibers are 60 to 70% brown substances 20 to 30% inside glycos uh, and there is water also in the ground substances there are glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans and adhesion proteins uh, fib fibers we have collagens in ligament we have 70 to 80 percent collagen type 1 type 3 10 percent and elastin it varies from ligament to ligament now the acl has been divided into three parts the proximal part the middle part and the distal part the proximal part is less solid. Slowly there is transition. Uh, the proximal part is less solid, highly cellular, rich in round and ovoid cells. The middle part, proximal one fourth of the middle part contains fusiform and spindle shaped fibroblast. That's why it is more prominent and it is called the fusiform zone. The distal part is more solid. As I said before, there is transition from less solid to more solid rich in it is rich in chondroblast the distal part and ovoid fibroblast ovoid fibroblasts low density of collagen uh, bundles excuse me ma'am one minute yes. Ma yes yes sure ma'am uh, now you can do the screen share oh it is not shared now uh, yes, ma'am, it's not sure. Sorry, ma'am, someone. Uh... Sorry for the interruption, but wait, wait, wait. Should I continue from this page only? Yes, ma'am, this page only, ma'am. Just now it got uh, cancelled. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. This fine now? Yes, ma'am, yes. Ma wait, I'll just shift this bar down. Okay, so we were seeing the uh, three parts, proximal part, middle part, and distal part. We have seen how it transits from a less solid to a more solid form. Now, we will see what it contains, the proximal part, middle part, and distal part, why it is so different. The proximal part contains more fusiform fibroblast collagen type 2 and glycoproteins, such as fibronectin and leminin. The middle part, is highly dense collagen fiber, special zone of cartilage and fibrocartilage, and elastin, it contains elastin and oxidalin fibers. The distal part, anterior portion of ACL, approximately 5 to 10 mm, proximal to tibial attachment, a layer of dense fibrous tissue surrounds the ligament instead of synovial tissue. So, these are the three different parts. Now we have to see the role of these three different parts and they have a clinical significance. According to them only, when we know what is the clinical significance of the role of these three parts, we can design the rehabilitation. So the role of proximal part, collagen type 2 and glycoproteins such as fibrinin and leminin, their interaction, their role is to interact between the adjacent con connective tissue cells and in addition of these cells to the collagen. The middle part, we have elastin on oxitalin. So elastin does shock absorption, the recurrent maximum stress is absorbed and uh, oxitalin withstand, mo withstands moderate, modest multidirectional stresses. So why we will see in later uh, during the rehabilitation part when we are seeing the rehabilitation part while doing rehabilitation uh, balance training we do multi-directional stresses like uh, 
we are standing uh, the we make the patient stand on a bosu ball and uh, the bosu ball keeps moving so different directions and then different directions it moves then we tell them to do star excursion again different directions are being explored there so the patients uh, they start retraining their proprioceptors in a way where they can withstand multidirectional stresses the distal part provides stability to the structure to the whole structure because it is more stable and as we have seen the insertion is fanned out uh, it is wider so it provides more stability to the structure i have told before that it is a transition zone so from femoral origin to tibial is insertion from a rigid bone it turns into a ligamentous tissue from there graduated change in stiffness of the ligament preventing stress concentration at uh, the attachment site then different layers of the ligament the first layer is fibrocartilaginous collagen bundle from there the second layer comes non mineralized cartilage zone the third layer is mineralized cartilage zone and the fourth layer is inserting at the subchondral bone plate again there is a transition let us look at the nerve supply this is the nerve supply also has a very clinical significance so the major supply is posterior articular branch of tibial nerve from there the fibers penetrate to the posterior joint capsule enters the synovial and periligamentous vessel surrounding the acl and reaches the reaches anterior to infrapatellar fat pad this is the this was the course of nerve supply now most of these fibers are associated with endoligamentous vasculature and have vasomotor function the receptors of the nerve fibers mentioned i'll mention it in the next slide Uh, so these receptors have the main role to play because whenever there is an injury all these receptors are receptors are ruptured so they forget they forget to give a feedback the receptors function is to give a feedback to the brain so we have to retrain the receptors to give the feedback to the brain how did how uh, what are the uh, feedbacks they give to the brain we'll see that so this is again from uh the basic biomechanics third chapter joint and joint structure and function cynthia knockings these are the four receptors that are present in the acl raffini receptor vector pecini receptor golgi tendon receptor and free nerve endings so the location and sensitivity we will see raffini receptors at the surface of the ligament predominantly on the femoral portion where the deformations are greatest so proximally the deformation is greatest during the acl tear so it is present there and it is sensitive to stretching that's why when there is more stretch it restrains more vector pecini receptor it is located at the femoral and tibial ends of the acl both the ends and it is sensitive to the rapid movements so while doing the rehabilitation uh, third phase uh prior to return to injury or the first stage of return to uh, sorry return to sports um, we practice inside the lab rapid movements for the patient reeducating the rapid movements you know side wise uh, side wise shuffles uh, front jump side jumps all these things golgi tendon receptors they are located near the attachment of the acl as well as at the surface beneath the synovial membrane so they are sensitive the golgi tendon receptors are sensitive to pressure and forceful joint motion with extremes of motion free nerve endings around the blood vessels we know free nerve endings they are the nociceptors so they are sensitive to the painful stimulus uh nos they are the nociceptors and non noxious and noxious mechanical and biomechanical stresses they are sensitive to so acl reflex this is a very important phenomenon 
while knowing the biomechanics of the ACL. So the receptors that we have seen before, the Ruffini, Pekini and Golgi tendons have proprioceptive functions. So proprioceptive training is one of the basic after ACL injuries. In cricket during off season, uh, during even uh, when we do the prehabs or you can say injury prevention, uh, you have, if you have heard Rupesh who has presented yesterday, his uh, um, presentation, it was very clearly explained what is done during the off seasons. So we basically for a uh, sports person during off season, we train, uh, we do a lot of proprioceptive activities, at least uh, four to five days a week. We do balance training with them, different kinds of balance training, different kinds of proprioceptive activities. So this helps in injury prevention. Now, when there is already an injury, proprioceptive function plays an important role. So we have to retrain the proprioceptors. They signal the knee postural changes. So again, uh, knee postural changes are being signaled by the uh, ACL reflex. So this has again a very significant clinical, clinical significance. When there is a knee injury, I mean, when there is an ACL injury, the patient initially feels tremendous pain and then they cannot feel anything around the knee. They cannot feel any movement. They feel something is absent there. So they cannot walk. They fear to walk. So when there is loss of signal in the knee postural changes, this happens. Deformation within the ligament influences the output of muscle spindle through the fusiform system. Hence, the activation of afferent nerve fibers in proximal part of ACL influences motor activity in the muscles around the knee. So they give uh, output to the muscles around the knee, the hamstring, the uh, quadriceps, quadriceps. These muscular responses are elicited by stimulation of group two and group three fibers, that, are the, uh, that is the mechanoreceptors. The ACL reflex is an essential part of normal knee function and is involved in the updating of muscle program. So when we are rehabilitating, uh, we update the muscle program, means there is progression every 10 days, uh, every 10 days or 14 days, we increase the load or resistance. We make the situations more difficult, the exercise situations more difficult for the patient so that there is relearning and updating of the muscle. It becomes even more obvious in patients with ruptured ACL where the loss of feedback from mechanoreceptors in ACL lead to quadriceps femoris weakness. Again, a subject of uh, lots of clinical importance. When you see a ACL patient, you can clearly see there is muscle wasting in the quadriceps femoris. Whatever rehabilitation you do, there will be one to two percent wasting in the quadriceps femoris. So when there is injury, we have to immediately after a day or two, we have to start quadriceps training contractions, voluntary quadriceps contractions. Let us now see the blood supply. Major blood supply arises from middle geniculate artery, but we know there is homogeneous distribution of blood supply around the uh, ligament. So distal part, of, distal part is vascularized by branches of lateral and medial inferior geniculate artery. There is an avascular zone. Every ligament has avascular zone. Within the uh, car fibrocartilage of the anterior part where the ligament faces the anterior rim of intercondylar fossa. The poor vascularity and presence of fibrocartilage undoubtedly plays an important role in poor healing potential of ACL. This is a setback of ACL injury. Now, many researchers 
have shown different things so i'm just going through i have gone through few researches and reviews and i have come to this collective conclusion which i am presenting to you uh the anterior part of anterior medial bundle is in direct contact with the intercondylar fossa and histological sections of this area reveal tenocyte and chondrocyte like cells as we have uh, discussed before it is completely different than any other ligament so we have uh, histological sections in which the cells are like tenocyte and chondrocytes so that's how it is very unique the acl this chondrocytes produce small amount of type 2 collagen cartilage specific uh, because of the direct contact with the cartilage and ligament the appearance of chondrocyte could be explained as a functional adaptation of the ligament to compressive stresses skelly and colic reported greater overall amd stiffness and strength and more strongly aligned collagen fibers when loaded so it is very important to load the acl for the health good health of acl due to the accordion like pattern in the matrix of without any fibrous damage the buffer provides mechanism for control of tension and acts as a shock absorber along the length of the tissue so small loads slowly forming the fib uh, the fibrils are being recruited and they form a crimp and then the larger loads elongates increasing number of fibrils become load bearing as larger loads are applied that is called recruitment again the basics of biomechanics recruitment gradually increases tissue stiffness this phenomenon allows the acl to rapidly provide additional protection to the joint mechanical load loading increases the density of the ligament thus improving the ligament strength so if we see in many studies done on marathon runners and uh, athletes who are constantly exposed to mechanical loading the acl uh, structure the acl density is more the acl is thicker than a person who has a sedentary lifestyle let us see the mechanism of injury how the injury occurs in we will see a video later first let us see how this happens so you can see we'll start from the foot because the foot is planted first so the foot is externally rotated it is pronated there is valgus dynamic valgus of the knee the hip is adducted ab abducted and externally rotated there is ipsilateral trunk tilt same side trunk tilt and contralateral spinal rotation so there have been cases of 30% direct contact injuries in acl indirect cases and non contact cases are more where the patient or where the person is or the athlete is off balance so non contact and indirect cases are 70% Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Sir, uh, Pawan, sir. 
சார் ஒரு 1 நிமிஷம் சார் நான் வரங்க சார் அவங்க வைஃபை டிஸ்கனெக்ட் ஆயிடுச்சு சார் ஓகே ஓகே ஓகே
Which slide did I leave? I, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. You just. Screen sharing for the Yes, screen share. Share screen. Ma'am, slide number 26, ma'am. Last slide. Yes, ma'am. This one, ma'am. Achha. मैं तो कितना आगे बोल ली? Okay. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma fine. So, shall I start? Yes, ma'am. We can. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. So we were seeing mechanism of injury. Um, the internet connection is unstable. Internet connection is unstable. Bolche. Tumi ekhen ta rakho ta. Mobile ta ke ekhen ta rakho. Hello, Nitin. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now it's fine, ma'am. Now it is fine. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Ma All right. So, did I complete this slide, or should I continue with this slide? Uh, you didn't complete this slide, ma'am. You have to uh, All right. stop on this slide. All right. All right. Okay. So, uh, we'll see the foot is planted here. The foot is pronated. There is dynamic valgus of the knee. The hip is abducted and externally rotated. And uh, there is ipsilateral trunk tilt, same side trunk tilt and contralateral rotation. So there are 30% cases of direct, con direct contact injuries in ACL and indirect and non-contact injuries are 70% due to wrong movements. Nitin, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am. It's clear, ma'am. You can go ahead, ma'am. Okay, fine. So it is more common in, sorry, common in young athletes associated with sports activities with pivoting, decelerating and jumping. A cut and plant movement is the typical mechanism that causes the ACL to tear, being a sudden change in direction or speed with the foot firmly planted. When the foot is firmly planted and we are trying to move in some other direction, the rotational twisting, landing from jump, pivoting, twisting, and direct impact on the front of tibia can be the mechanism of injury. So we will see this is a normal foot planted where the, there is tibial rotation, neutral, no tibial rotation. The foot is plantar flexed. The hamstrings are working. And extensors, glutes are working. Glutes and abductors are working. Here, if we see, it is rotated. So there is opposite rotation. There is less, it is less flexed, more extended. And there is valgus force. So extensors and quadriceps are working here. Dorsiflexors are working. The foot is pronated. So peroneus and tibialis anteriors are working while the calves and tibialis posterior should be working here. That is why while doing, so this picture also has clinical significance. While we train during rehabilitation, it is very important plyometrics. During the plyometrics uh, rehabilitation phase, we have to train the person to jump land in a safer way with flexed hip and knee so that the absorption of force is even and there is less scope of injury. 
Next slide. Nitin, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm there. I'm there, ma'am. All right. All right. So I'm playing the video. We will see how the injury occurs here. So this is the knee joint. The ACL is coming from behind to front. So this is the ACL. Sorry, this is the ACL. This is the PCL. So there are rotational forces. As you can see, as I explained, knee in valgus. Now, because of this rotation, twisting, there is rupture. Next slide. We'll see a few injuries how they are occurring on field. Down for Savage. Got a couple of options. So he falls. So you can see his knee hyperextended. Hyperextended right knee. Next video. Okay. So. Uh, so he'll be tested out as Crips go. Okay. So we have seen the mechanism of injury, how the injury happens. Okay. An athlete to be off balance, held by an opponent, avoiding collision with an opponent or have adopted an unusually wide foot position. These perturbations contribute to ACL injury by causing the athlete to plant the foot so as to promote unfavorable lower extremity alignment. Unfavorable lower extremity alignment, which may be compounded by inadequate muscle protection and poor neuromuscular control. Fatigue and loss of concentration may also be a factor. So as we have seen in the previous presentation that we had seen yesterday evening, how um, adequate rest, adequate nutrition, adequate recovery is important. If a player is continuously playing few matches and there is uh, more stress, mental as well as physical, there is not adequate recovery, then there is fatigue and loss of concentration during the match. Women are seen to be more prone, three times more prone than men. There may be various factors, different shape of intercondylar notch. Nitin, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. okay. So smaller size and different shape of intercondylar notch uh, can be a reason and Mostly in non-athletes, OA leading to ACL injury. Ma'am, uh, there is a lag, ma'am. Just a second. Can you just mute me? I'll just check the connection. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Muting myself. Is it fine now? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, next is uh, hormonal variations. So, in women, hormones always play a game. They sometimes go, uh, there are many hormonal swings in women. So, estrogen directly regulates the ligament structure. Ligament laxity may be because of hormonal imbalances and function by uh, alteration of type 1 and type 3 synthesis at mRNA level while application of mechanical force 
decreases the ex expression of collagen type 1 and type 2 genes at all estrogen levels tested. So it has been tested that when there is sufficient mechanical loading throughout the year, the ACL is healthy, these hormonal variations does not hamper the game much. Shoe surface interface, again, if there is not proper shoes, the meteorological environment, uh, meteorological means the weather conditions are not good. The uh, If somebody has practiced in a wooden floor and then suddenly coming to concrete or grass, frictional forces that are working. Neuromuscular factors, we have already discussed the neuromuscular factors previously, why it plays a very important role in ACL injury. Okay, grades of injury. So basically, uh, the ACL has been graded in three sprain acl sprain has been graded in three different grades grade one grade two and grade three there are many other classifications also in discussion but they are not yet proved so there are some alpha uh, alphabetic and numeric gradations as well which sees uh, the amb and plb separately we i'm just giving a brief overview of that gradation i have not kept it in the slides because it is not uh, it is still under experimentation so uh, they have graded it as uh, numeric that is one two three four five as femoral origin rupture mid substance rupture tibial origin rupture and the whole structure outside and inside so they have given one, two, three, four, five, and for PLB also same way. The, uh, the femoral origin, tibial origin, mid substance, and the whole whole circle thing. They have given it, separated it in this way, and they give it as if, uh, and that is, the PLB is given in alphabetic way A B C D, and AMB is given in one, two, three, four, five, and while they give the report they combine it like 1a that is femoral origin rupture of amb with femoral origin rupture of plb so this is just an example but i have not put it this is just for general knowledge now we'll see the three grades of sprain so grade one sprain the fibers are stretched but no tear little tenderness and swelling uh, the knee does not feel unstable or give out during the activity. No increased laxity and there is a firm end fill. Firm end fill means the ligament is fine. Not much tear. Grade 2. So grade 1, what we can do, uh, we can go for conservative rehabilitation only. We don't need surgical rehabilitation for this. You know, surgical management for grade one sprains grade two sprain partially torn or incomplete tear with hemorrhage <coughs> little tenderness and moderate swelling with some loss of function joint may feel unstable give out during the activity so there is giving away feeling during the activity increased anterior translation Yet there is still a firm end fill. So the ligament is still secured to some extent. Painful and pain increased with latchment test and anterior drawer stress test. We do this test for special test to check the um, ligament integrity. So during the test, the pain increases. Grade 2 sprain can also be considered for conservative management in older uh people and children grade 3 spain complete torn ruptured acl tenderness but limited pain maybe little or a lot of swelling lack of control in knee movement feels unstable giving way feeling at certain times rotational instability as indicated by a positive pivot shift test 
no end point evident the end point is soft and feel is soft there's no form and feel hematrosis occurs within 1 to 2 hours grade 3 athletes they are considered eligible for surgical reconstruction of acl but uh, i have seen many patients older patients with grade 3 sprain meniscal tear and MCL, older adults, females, they have recovered with conservative treatment because they did not want to go for a surgery at the age of 63, 64. Clinical presentation occurs after either a cutting maneuver or single leg stance, landing or jumping, maybe an audible pop crack at the time of injury. A feeling of initial instability, which may be masked later by extensive swelling. Episodes of giving way, especially on pivoting twisting motions. Patient has a trick knee or predictable instability. Mostly we see while walking, they have a buckling of knee. While coming down the stairs, there's buckling of knee. So evident instability. Uh, torn ACL is extremely painful, particularly immediately after sustaining the injury. Swelling, usually immediate and extensive, but can be minimal or delayed. Movement is restricted and inability to fully extend the knee. So the quadriceps is hampered here. Tenderness, possibly widespread, but mild. Tenderness at the medial aspect of the joint may indicate a cartilage injury. Associated injury. So I have discussed before also meniscal lesions, 50%, more than 50% of facial ruptures are associated with meniscal lesions. If seen in a combination with medial meniscus tear and Medial collateral ligament tear. It is termed as Oden Odenhus <coughs> Onohus Od Odenhus triad. Sorry. Medial collateral ligament injuries are also associated with ACL rupture. There may be bony contusion and micro fractures, chondral injuries, tibial plateau fractures. We'll see uh, an X ray of a tibial plateau fracture later in the slides. Posterolateral coronal injury, mostly associated with the lateral collateral ligament injury and uh, popliteal injuries, popliteal cyst or Baker cyst. These are all. These can be associated with ACL. So, physical assessment. The clinical tests that we do are. The most common three tests that we are doing are latchman test, anterior drawer test of knee, pivot shift test. Investigations are x-rays, MRIs. MRIs are the most, you know, uh, they have the most specificity of proving a ligament injury. We'll see MRI images as well in later slides. There is arthroscopy, another way of checking, investigating ACL injury. And um, KT2000 arthrometer test, it is to check the ligament laxity. It's an equipment tool. We'll see the equipment, picture of the equipment. So, Latchman test. The Latchman test is used to identify ACL tears and is considered the most sensitive test for ACL ruptures. To perform the Lachman test, the patient should be relaxed in the supine position. Passively place the patient's knee into 20 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. The examiner will stabilize the patient's distal femur on the leg to be tested. With the other hand, place your thumb on the tibial tuberosity and firmly grasp the lower leg near the tibial or forward translation of the tibia. A positive test occurs when the tibia translates forward beyond the rest of the position and more than two millimeters in comparison to the opposite knee. A positive test results in a soft end feel as opposed to a firm end feel in which the tibia does not translate forward. Hey, if you found this video to be helpful and to the point, can you... Okay, anterior drawer test. So we see a complete rupture in this. Uh, the patient 
is lying supine with knee flexed 90 degrees and the therapist sits on the foot of the patient uh, to stabilize the foot uh, to stabilize the extremity and with the thumb he uh, tries to feel the translation more than 2 mm of translation uh, we can we'll see more than 2 mm of translation is said to have acl rupture so we can see it is completely coming out here this is anterior drawer test pivot shift test Lateral pivot shift test the supine patient straight leg is elevated 20 to 30 degrees off the table 20 to 30 degrees internal tibial rotation and valgus force through the knee while passively flexing the patient's knee to 40 degrees a sensation of giving way suggests ACL injury. So, uh, the pivot shift test will feel a clunk in the tibia while performing the test. That will uh, say the instability of the joint. So, X ray, <coughs> we can see a bony shape coming out, a virgin fracture, mostly known as uh, Segon's fracture, the tibial plateau, anterior tibial spine, it has come up, we can see here, here also. This is an MRI, this is a normal ACL, you can see it is coursing from posterior to anterior spiral. Here, white substance, you can't see there is ACL tear, torn ACL, a complete rock. So, this is uh, Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. There, there, there was a lag, ma'am. Oh, okay. The previous slide was clear? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, you can just uh, off your video, ma'am. You can just continue with your audio. At the end, you can just turn your video. Ma okay. So, I have to go back to the slides? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. You can just uh, down and have an option to stop your video. Yes, ma'am. Fine, ma'am. You can continue. Wait. I can't see any option. Can you do it for me? Yes, ma'am. The video is off, ma'am. You can do it. We can continue. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we have seen this. Sigon's fracture. We can see the tibial plateau coming up. So this is an KT2000 arthrometer, which checks the ligament laxicity. So it is being pulled like this, the same as we perform the tests. So treatment, we will be dealing with conservative management today. I have asked for a second day from Suresh sir. Uh, and he has been kind enough to provide me a second slot where we will be discussing ACL reconstruction and rehabilitation return to play for ACL athletes. So immediately after injury, rice, the improvised formation of rice. So we have to protect the joint. We provide protective equipments like a, a brace, rest to the joint, ice compression, 10, 8 to 10 minutes of icing every two hours is suggested. Compression, compression of the joint so that the swelling is... Uh, revealed, relieved and elevation of the joint again to reduce the swelling and we increasing the venous return. So these are the two types of tapes, supports that are used. This is a rigid tape and this is a kinesio tape. Rigid tapes, we have certain 
false in this in this image i could not find a better image um there has to be an under tape because rigid tapes they contain zinc oxide and they uh, actually stick so much to the skin that when you take it off they come up with the skin so you have to be very careful apply uh, preparation of skin is very important and then apply uh, under tape and then apply this tape so it has been applied from lateral to medial and again medial to lateral to stop the anterior translation there is this is the distal anchor and the proximal anchor and it is even supported with more tapes up above this and now we are coming to this so the knee is flexed hanging mostly we first provide this tape for anterior translation fixing it and then from up to down with minimal stress we'll start with no stretch and then minimal stretch and again stopping with no stretch same in this direction these uh, kinesio tapes also come in synthetic form and cotton form there are rock tapes which are even better forms and they uh, do not get wet the synthetic tapes and the rock tapes and they provide better stability and mobility if somebody after an acl injury wants to go for a play then we can provide mobility more and with kt tapes we can provide more mobility conservative management is indicated with patients in patients with partial tear or no stability in no instability symptom complete tear with no symptom of instability non athletes sedentary lifestyle people and children the precautions that we have to take is modification of activities because we want the person to be active we don't want them to lie on the bed they feel uh, at least they don't want to lie on the bed after an injury they want to continue with the good limbs the good parts of the body which are not injured so modification of activities are prescribed exercises after swelling decreases and weight bearing processes weight bearing progresses we have to do exercise for life whether injured or not injured so when you are injured you have to be more careful and exercise regularly muscle strengthening braces rehabilitation braces and functional braces this is a complete rehabilitation brace brace there is compression also to you know reduce the swelling here this is a later stage in our later stage of injury we can prescribe this brace this is more functional this is a hinge brace okay next rehabilitation okay Re what is the main purpose of rehabilitation restoring the range of motion that we have lost during the injury quadriceps activation in open chain as soon as possible proximal hamstring activation in closed chain strengthening that emphasizes proximal hip control via glutes and core control stretching balance training that is proprioceptive training movement education and some form of feedback to the patient during the training movement education is very important from yesterday's presentation we have seen how all the muscles are being activated during the performance of exercise when mind and body is connected so movement education is very important so that we will do quality work in a shorter period of time quantity does not matter there is no means of doing rehabilitation for 4 hours the brain cannot concentrate so we will do quality work where we know all the muscles are being active so the technique has to be very appropriate so movement education and jump training plyometrics such as landing with increased flexion of hip and knee that we have already discussed before agility training jump training and agility training are the rehabilitation 
of phases of phase three and phase four. We will discuss it in day two post-op rehabilitation. So the rehabilitation tools that we generally use in our clinic. This is a Thera tube. These are small loop resistance bands. These are large loop resistance bands. These are thicker. So they are all color coded. So the resistance increases with the colors. This is a foam pad, stability pad. This is a foam roller. And this is a BOSU ball, proprioceptive activities. We can do in proprioceptive activities with this as well as with this. Protocols for non-operative rehab. This is not a fixed protocol. We can change the protocol according to the patient's need. Phase one is the acute phase. The goal is to control the pain and swelling, restore pain-free range of motion, improve flexibility of the joint, normalize gait mechanics, establish good quadriceps activation. The recommended exercises, range of motion, so patellar mobilization, then uh, you already know, I guess, what is patellar mobilization. Still, I will try to play this video. Welcome to patellar mobilization. This is an exercise you will do 30 reps in every direction. When we say every direction, that means up and down and also side to side. You'll want to do this three times a day, going both up and down, as you see right there, and side to side as well. 30 reps, three times. Okay, so that is patellar mobilization. It is not necessary to do 30 reps. You can do more than that as well. If the patient cooperates, you can teach it to the patient. They can do it at home as well as a home exercise. This will reduce the swelling and improve the patellar mobility around the joint, which will help in gaining the further range of motion, flexion, extension of the knee. Belt stretches, calf and hamstring stretches. Uh, hold for 30 seconds, three to five reps. This is the calf is being stretched. So hip is more in flexion and you can do it with a um, jumbo resistance band as well, thicker resistance band and a yoga belt. Hamstring is being stretched here. <coughs> Welcome to Patella Sorry. Mobile. So heel slides. Again, sets and reps are according to the patient's convenience. But we will try to do more reps, maybe three sets of 20 reps that will help heal and improve the range of motion more. So they can do it twice daily or thrice daily. Whenever they are free, the patient can do heel slides. So it will improve the range of motion. <coughs> Sorry. Prone quadriceps stretch. Quadriceps stretch prone. This is being done with a yoga belt. You can also do it with a jumbo band. Then stationary cycle. Initially, we will not give any resistance because the aim is to achieve the range of motion. So, and cycling will give a little confidence to the patient. So, 10 to 15 minutes. We can use cycling in the warm up. We can do it pre warm up and uh, post exercise also. We can do cycling that will help them mobilize easily, uh, help them to gain their mobility easily. Concentric and eccentric knee range of motion. This is a must when there is an ACL injury who comes to our clinic. What we tell them to lie down prone and flex their knee as much as possible and extend it slowly, very slowly. And almost by the count of 12 or 15, they have to extend it fully. Again, go back fast, flex the knee, and then extend it very slow. You have to monitor the patient constantly because the patient tends to do the uh, knee extension rapidly. So there is hamstring co-contraction when we're doing this extension. 
rapid quadriceps contraction this is another very important thing we are not doing isometric here so we keep the foam roller below the patient is in long sitting we ask them to put the foam roller below the knee and we tell them to do rapid quadriceps contraction so there is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so the quadriceps is controlling uh, contracting and the heel is coming up so this is this gains the momentum and there is quadriceps strengthening as well this also helps in reducing the swelling there's pumping on the joint and then the healing healing is more easily done strength uh, coming to the strengthening part, the most important part of this rehabilitation program and my most favorite part. So quadriceps sets, you can design it according to the patient's need. So the patient is lying in uh, this position, one leg flexed. The core is contracted. The rib is tucked in. Lutes are active, the scapula is also active, and the quadriceps. So we make we tell them to do hip circles. We tell them to make circles, making it more interesting. Circles become very boring for them after a certain point of time. Ten circles this side, ten clockwise, ten circle anti-clockwise. So we can also make it interesting by telling them to make uh, shapes or it becomes more complex when we tell them to make shapes or we tell them to make alphabets, write A, B, C with their foot. So in, from here, they have to make A, B, C. So there is more quadriceps contraction. This is a very extensive exercise. Then we can do the same thing for hips, for glute activation, glutes medius, hip circles, like here, this lady is doing hip circles. We can again make them do a b c d and shapes slr two to three seats we all know what is slr straight leg raise glutes we can make them do initially without a resistance band this is a small resistance band that is being used clampshire we have to remember to contract the core contract the glutes so that there is good the pelvic uh, pel lumbar pelvic stability is there and then contract the medius glutes medius and do the movement when we are doing the movement with the particular muscle contraction and stabilizing the body it becomes more effective as rupesh has said in his previous uh, presentation bridging again lots of glute contraction and core contraction we have to tell the patient to push through the heel mostly saying the hands up holding so that they don't take the hand support to go up in bridging we how do we instruct while doing the bridging we say squeeze your butts as hard as possible as if you're holding a coin between your butt cheeks and it should not fall. If it falls, you have to pick it up. So it is funny, but then they have to do it. You can see the contraction. When you're seeing a patient, when they're contracting the muscle, you can see. And that is a feedback that you are getting that the patient is doing the exercise in a right way. And that is a feedback for the patient as well. Bodyweight squats. Initially, in an ACL injury, they're very scared to do bodyweight squats. So we, in our clinic, use uh, TRX. So TRX is a total resistance training uh, equipment. It is nothing but a suspension. Uh, there is a sling that is attached from the ceiling. And they hold it. And with that, they go down. So holding, they get a support. And then they go down. And while they come up, they have to squeeze their butt as hard as possible again the same thing pushing through the heel and coming up we have to take care that the knee position is right we have to take care that they are not using their quadriceps while coming up they have to use their glutes while doing the while coming up from the squat so trx has given us very good result in our clinic um, so we can also use a chair 
if they can do a squat initially partial range and then slowly we can progress to a much deeper squat sitting and standing total knee extension with theraband or cable so this is sitting again core contraction glutes in every exercise we have to contract the core and the glutes and the body is stable and then we have to contract the muscle specific muscle that we are uh, isolating and reinforcing so here we have to make sure that the patient is contracting the quadriceps and squeezing their quadriceps and doing the movement we can also do it in a cable here this is the end range extension in standing Next slide now we enter the subacute or the strengthening phase this is an advanced after two two weeks we can start with the sub subacute phase the goal is to avoid patellofemoral patellofemoral pain maintain range of motion and flexibility restore muscle strength improved neuromuscular control range of motion again continue range of motion and initiate lower extremity mobility exercises like uh, like we can do glute series we can do <coughs> hamstring mobility exercises we can do calf mobility exercises they are all open chain exercises and we can also continue with the cycling we can add on some little bit of resistance level 1 or level 2 of resistance as per the patient's convenience again again strengthening continued open chain and hip knee strength with weight <coughs> we will uh, increase the weight slowly and increase the resistance slowly hamstring strengthening progress 2 to 3 sets of 15 to 20 reps again depending on the patient hamstring strengthening we can initially i think i have put an image here you can see hamstring curls but initially uh, when we are doing hamstring curls let us not take the patient initially to this machine hamstring curl machine we can make them lie prone on the bed with uh, the knees out and we can put a thera band the small loop band hold it down and ask the patient to go against resistance do the movement do the hamstring curls so uh leg press improving the quadriceps progressing from single leg to bilateral so this is uh glutes again single leg bridging again same firing the glutes firing the core we can also do a, a glute ham raise where the foot is not down the foot is kept on a stool up on a stool the patient is lying down and they have to do the same activity the same way bridging but on a higher stool i don't have a picture of this but i hope i can explain if you want i can show you i mean i can perform and show you okay then this is a crab walk this is lateral side to side slightly squatting slight flexion of the hips core is fully contracted the glute medius are firing here and the body is upright the same way there is something called monster walk where the patient walks in front in same position the same way this hello nitin hello Hello, yes, Nitin. Yes, Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. So, uh, the crab walk, the same way monster walk when we are going in front, hip slightly flexed position. We have to hold that position, squeeze our tummy, squeeze our butts as hard as possible, and move front like a monster.
step up progressions training for steps so we can take a stool and ask them to do again same we have to contract the core and the butt and use the quadriceps while going up and the glutes while going up push through the heel and go up uh, the same way lateral step up squat progression single leg squats as much as they can mostly single leg squats they can do in during the fourth week young athletes older age people it takes more time so we have to help them around we have to understand when they can perform it and then give we can initially give a stick to hold or a stable surface to hold and then do a single leg squat then progress to free hand single leg squat core activities again very important plank hold side planks sorry this is planks i've written planks i'm sorry uh, dead bugs alternate hand and leg movement dead bugs hundreds this is hundreds i don't have a picture of dead bugs here this is a plank hold this is side plank hold where your obliques and core are working this full core is working your shoulder your uh, shoulder protractors are working this is a bear plank hold again working a lot on your core and your quadriceps here your core are, core is working a lot we can add resistance to the uh dead bugs add resistance to this and this as well we can do in unstable this by uh, jackknife that is called we can flex the knee and flex the hands and do these are all progressions and proprioceptive activities like single leg stance initially we can start with single leg stance on the floor then we can progress to single leg stance on a foam pad to on a bosu ball we can also tell them single leg stance with eyes closed on the floor on the foam roll and on the bosu ball slowly single leg stance on bosu ball single leg landing teaching single leg landing then multitasking balance activities so multitasking balance activities is like so, so they are standing suppose they are standing on a bosu ball and the therapist throws them a ball in different directions left right up down sides so they have to hold it so they have to concentrate multitasking they have to concentrate on holding the ball as well as being stable on the bosu ball star excursion and y balance this is star excursion so they have to touch with the toe in different directions multi axial this is this is y balance this also there is a machine called y balance test where there is this is a functional test um where the patient has to touch anterior anterior medial anterior medial and anterior lateral so they give a feedback whether how much control you are doing and uh, this is a biofeedback this is not but they generally have boxes under them and uh, you know uh, wires wires through wires they send signal then uh, there are many functional tests when we are doing the return to play uh presentation i will show you there are single leg hop tests double leg hops uh sorry triple hop tests 6 meter hop tests so these are all functional tests i have not mentioned them i'm just telling you um these are all hop tests done for func uh, functional assessment whether the player or athlete is ready for the return of the play if there is pain and instability during the test immediately we stop and go back to our rehabilitation program so these are the references i have taken all the from these um researches 
the journey has just begun there is a long way to go so the most interesting part will be the day two when we will be seeing 